Um, if you weren't here yesterday, I'm just going to repeat that um, Dan is a research scientist at Google, and he's been working in the, er in the uh, area of search quality with a focus on understanding what makes Google users happy. So uh, is it, do you have your oh, user experience research? You, right. It doesn't say Uber. No, on it's it. actually Uber Tech Lead for search quality and user happiness. Okay, so we have to be happy. <laughs> um, happy, skilled, and competent in their use of web search. He is sometimes also called a search anthropologist uh, because of his focus on understanding how people use the tools of technology to amplify their intelligence. But his research methods draw equally on ethnography and field work, lab studies, classical usability analysis, eye tracking experiments, and large scale logs analysis. In other words, he has a PhD in computer science, unlike the rest of us here. <laughs> so, um, oh, I have an, an announcement here, and that is someone has left their cell phone uh, here in the room, and it is her name is It Girl, I think. Um, so if you're It Girl, uh, could, could come somebody see tweet me, that? <laughs> or else, just tweet it with a hashtag: yeah. It Girl, come get your phone in this room. Yeah, we have the phone, and um, also the tip sheet is available here. But but when you get to it, you'll notice that it's asking you to click and ask for permission. Dan will then give you permission as soon as he gets out of the room. Yeah. So. Um, that's the little uh, thing. If you don't get through, you'll be able to get it later. Right. So uh, we'll, we'll have questions afterwards, and please uh, get your questions ready. And also, we are being live streamed, so if you don't want to be on the air, don't come up and ask a question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, go ahead, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Margo. So I have some bad news, and I've got some good news. The bad news is that that second bit.ly link is the list of the PDF of all the slides I'm going to be using today. If anybody has downloaded it, it's roughly 185 slides. That's the bad news. The good news is we're not going to talk about all those slides. You can take it home and study it at your leisure. So what I'm going to do is go through a few of the highlights here, and we'll leave time at the end for questions, and we can drill down. And for almost any question, I either have a slide or a quick demo. So this is going to be kind of in response to uh, what people are interested in, what I think, uh, may, things you might not know. First question, how many of you were in my session yesterday? I want to get a quick, holy cow. Okay, thank you. That was great. Um, I, feel, I feel validated. Um, so what I'm going to do is just jump right in, because the point of this session is to really show you some methods, some things you may or may not know about. I guarantee that everyone will learn at least four or five things they don't know about, mostly because we just added them. You can't possibly know about them. And that's one thing to remember about Google, um, truthfully about all the search engines, is that we have a whole cadre of engineers who are busily changing things. What that means is that they're constantly adding new capabilities, new features, new data, new crawlers, new whatever. The bad thing is that means you're perpetually a student. The good thing is, I have a job forever. <laughs> so this is a mix of interesting news. So I'm going to start, just jump right in with the very first thing. Uh, first question, how many of you have used search by image? OK. OK, good. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly then, except I'll slow down when it gets to the new part. Suppose you've got an image like this one. As you know, you can drag that image into Google's image search. You, there's another system out there called TinEye. You can use something similar like this. Um, I think ours has much larger coverage than TinEye. We also have some uh, fairly tuned algorithms. Uh, one of the things I can, I can show you at the end, if you're interested in, is the new, where we're going with this sort of knowledge-based image retrieval stuff. But I don't have, it's so new, I don't have slides on it. Anyway, once you do that, what it will do is discover, by doing image matching over the entire corpus of the Google image set, to see which images match it. And in this case, what it does, it says, oh, not only does this image match this image from somewhere else, so in this vis visually similar images, but by the way, I found it in this book. Okay, and there's the Wikipedia entry for that book. So you thought you were just asking for this image, but we in fact know that it's part of this book. What this means is that we have all the, those books we've scanned, you can find the images in them. So a few million books, and we've got them all. 
along with all the images people have posted on their G plus profiles and they put on their website and all that stuff, all right? So one of the things, I'll anticipate your question, no, we don't really do face reco. We do image recognition, and the way it works is it basically creates what's called a digital profile for each image, which is basically the colors, the texture in the image, and all that stuff. So for example, it doesn't do anything in particular for your eyes and your nose and your mouth, which is sort of the basis of face recognition. So it's really no good for picking out you know, that terrorist image you, you found on the web somewhere. If he happens to be in a place with a lot of very distinctive background, we will find that image if there are a lot of copies of that image, but it's not really doing face reco. What's nice, though, is that you, because of this property, you can ask questions that seem impossible. True story. I was sitting in my office, and this, my office mate is quite a good photographer, and he has a screensaver of his favorite pictures. This picture showed up on his screensaver, and I turned around and said, Simon, where is that? And he says, you know, I, I don't have any idea. I took it so long ago, I don't remember. So we took that picture, dragged it into image search, and this is what we found. Um, we found that it's being used by the Red Rock Canyon Interpretive Association. Who knows about copyright? Um, it's one of those things where, you know, images get out there. I'm sure this happens to you. But we found that it's, in, in fact, the picture taken at that location. So what this does is it shifts questions of images, like where is this image taken, into what was previously impossible to something that's basically trivial. Now, th one of the reasons you want to know what's possible here is because it shifts the way you think. For instance, I found this device when I moved into my house. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody? Great. I'm, I'm batting a 1,000 here. Um, it, it is a, a particular kind of wrench. It's about this big. Okay, so what I did is I took this photograph by putting it on a white sheet of paper and just taking a quick digital image of it. I then dragged that into Google Image Search. And the question is, why would I shoot it against the white background? Because I know all the product catalogs in the universe have their things displayed on very neutral backgrounds. Okay? I didn't worry too much about the rotation, just a very neutral background. I found it. I dragged it in. And I discovered very quickly that it comes from, it, so you see the image now is in a different rotation. This is actually from those catalogs. This is a foam pale wrench. This is what firefighters use when your house is on fire and they want to squirt foam all over it. They need to get the soap suds into their fire truck. They get this device, open up the pail, and dump the soap into their fire truck, and it squirts out foam. They need a special device for that. They don't have a can opener, I guess. Okay? But this is one way you can shift the way you think about doing search. Now, you can start to ask questions of things that you wouldn't, what would you have typed in? Big silver wrench. Good luck. <laughs> it's not going to work. Um, another really great example, um, these are all true stories, by the way. Um, uh, I was on a park bench in San Francisco, and this caterpillar is running towards me. And as you know, some caterpillars are actually toxic. You shouldn't touch them, and it will cause a rash. And so I thought, touch or no touch? <laughs> So I took out my camera, my phone, and I just took a picture, and I dragged it into Google Image Search like that. This is my picture. I dragged it in. And it told me that it's a, a – actually, the first page of results says all these yellow and black things, bumblebees, cars, people dressed as bumblebees or as cars. <laughs> um, but then what I did is I added a little bit of information to the search. That thing up there, I added insect or caterpillar, and it focused the search of yellow and black things from infinity to just insects and caterpillars. Then what I noticed is down here, you can see what the result is. It's actually the caterpillar of the spotted tussock moth in the United States. It's not only non-toxic, it's edible. <laughs> it's up to you. The things you find in Google search are remarkable, okay? But what I wanted to point out here is this technique. There are a couple techniques we've talked about. Taking the picture of the object in isolation, then doing a catalog search for, for things like that. Adding information to an image search to 
narrow the focus down. If I had, for example, written tiger up there, I'd get a different set of results. Right? Now, there's one other thing I want to tell you about search by image. <laughs> Oftentimes, people will come to me and say, I did this search by image, and it didn't work. Well, imagine my surprise. Um, it's a big image taken from a non-standard position, and it's just kind of weird, right? Um, so when you do this search uh, by image with this image, you get nothing. Okay? However, there's a well-known trick you can use, which is to focus in. You crop the image down to, in this case, the logo. The same technique works if you're, for example, in a very well-known touristic spot. Take an image of or crop down to a really salient feature, something that everybody takes a picture of, and search for that. What it does is it's just now searching for that. In, in this case, it discover, you discover quickly it's that hotel, and that's, another, that's the matching image in the lower left corner. So we went from this sort of big, arbitrary picture with a lot of elements into it into just the relevant salient bit. Humans are really good at this. Computers are really bad at that. Help it out. So focus in on the logo or whatever. Now, an example of this was uh, I got a, a message recently from a police chief in the uh, southern part of the United States who said, thank you for telling me the cropping trick because I was able to discover which band of graffiti taggers in my city were going around tagging everything. Because what he had been doing is taking a photograph of the wall with 100 tags on it, 100 graffiti marks. Of course that's not going to work. He used this trick to crop down to just one, and he found the kid's Facebook page <laughs> and all of his friends. Okay? So this is a really valuable, valuable thing to know. So the, the quick summary here on, on searching by images um, Search by image works over the space of all images. It uses this digital profile. We're also, we have these most common views or most common images because what it's doing right now is it's not identifying the objects in the image. It's looking for matching pictures. Matching pictures, okay? When you want to get a particular, you have a large complex image, focus in on just a particular region, a distinctive element or distinctive logo, Okay? So that opens up, I think, a whole new space of possibilities. So let me open up a different, different file on, on image search. Because uh, you probably know that images come in many colors, right? And Google Image Search allows you to filter by different facets, like the size or the color or whatever. So in this case, I want to show how to, how to filter by color. So you do your search. In this case, I'm looking for a Rosa Parks book. And you can click up there on the search tools. That's the number one item there. Click on the ser search tools, and that opens up a submenu right below it, okay, which has options to filter by size, by color, by type, by time, and so on, or usage rights if you, if you want to. It'll look for the Creative Commons tag on that. So in this case, I'm clicked on the color option, pop down, and you can, for example, look for different colors there. And I now realize this, this slide is now out of date. Um, because you can also look for uh, uh, type animated. You can look for animated GIFs if you want. But anyway, one of the handy things here is you can select a particular color chip and then look for all the pictures that color, filtered by that color, with that color predominantly. The reason you might want to use this, I was talking to somebody, uh, a journalist, who was remembering that he read a book a while ago about money laundering in Southeast Asia. Like, Great, that doesn't help me much. Give me more. And he said, it's yellow. <laughs> True story, I did a search for money laundering book cover in image, Google Image Search, filtered by yellow, and it was the third hit. Because, remember, he said Southeast Asia. The book is about money laundering in Malaysia. Close enough, right? We don't have a filter by region of the globe. Right? At least not for images, and certainly not for book titles. But you can recognize that kind of property very, very quickly. So that's a nice combination of visual recognition along with this added capability of doing image search by image. Yeah, now, you, yeah. That's a very old story for librarians. Yes, <laughs> that's absolutely right. The li classic librarian reference thing is the kid comes in and says, 
I want this book about Rosa Parks, and all I know is it's green, right? <laughs> and that's actually with a motivating case for that. Great story. Um, one other thing to, to note, uh, in the, uh, the type pull down there, you can look for different kinds of things, um, including animated exists, as I mentioned. But one of the color properties you can do here is transparent. See that right there in the middle? That's for plate pasting logos on top of other stuff. You get the, tr the logo with a transparent background. Okay, so when you're putting together your, your presentations, I assume you're checking the usage rights as well. But, you know, that's the really handy trick to know. Okay, so let's move from the realm of images to how you stay connected with your topic or with your people you're studying or the projects you're working on. How many people here use alerts? Okay. Okay, the rest of you need to pay attention, okay? So that's like 50% of you. Um, Google Alerts are like your person sitting at Google typing every day the same query, right? It basically is a query that you post on Google Alerts. It's all private. It's just on your, uh, your, your query. And it runs it every day. And you can select if you want to it, have it search over news, over the web, if you want it to send you every update or once a week update or whatever. You basically go to that website, and you can fill out, you log in with a Google account, and you can log in and create a standing query. Now, if you came to yesterday's talk, one of the great things about alerts is that you can create a query which uses all of the glory, all of the special operators in Google search, like site colon. So if, for example, you're really interested in press re releases coming from IBM, you would say, in your alert, site call on ibm.com, press release. And it's going to sit there every day and run that query and then send you emails, updates. So this is particularly handy, as I said, for monitoring businesses. Um, I have a couple that I have set up to monitor for my boss or for me. I have ego alerts. So anytime somebody writes something, so for example, if any of you write something about me, I will get email about it. So I've got, I got, Friends high in alerts, you know, who are doing this. But you can do this too, okay? Okay, so that's the alerts mechanism. And it, it, we'll talk more at, at the end here about special operators you can use. But it's a really handy mechanism to, to use to keep in track of things. Now, one of the things I, I need to talk about with you is sort of some properties of Google that people don't really understand. One of them is the number of, of results. Repeat after me. <laughs> It's an estimate. <laughs> it's an estimate, okay? The, the reason that's important is that I've seen people write articles saying, I did this search, and I had 10,000 results. I did this other search, and I got 11,000 results. That's not an important difference, okay? In particular, it, it boggles my mind when I see these in legal briefings. You should not be using this as the basis for any legal argument at all, Okay? The only thing that matters in numbers of estimates of results is the leading digit and sort of the number of zeros after it, and that's kind of all that counts. Here's an example. If you go to Google now and say Crabapple, the query in US, you'll get a little over a million results. Now, if you modify that query to say Crabapple pie recipe, it will drop it down the way you expect because it's implicitly anding all those search terms together. So as you know, <coughs> from classical Boolean logic, if you add additional search terms, the results number goes down, right? So in this case, we get 73,000, which is a lot less, okay? Now, here's the paradoxical behavior. I'm going to add another search term, which you think should make the number of results smaller, right? Well, when we add best at the end, it goes up to 84,000, okay? So there's two things to know. A... It's an estimate, and it's a gross estimate. It's not a precise estimate. And that, I, I can tell you about that offline sometime. It, it's a really interesting reason why we can't tell you the exact number. We actually cannot tell you the exact number. Um, the second thing is that when Google starts to run out of results, it works harder. And what's happening is it's going deeper and deeper into the index that we have, and it's digging up an additional 10,000 results. Okay? So... When you do see query, query results like this, be careful. Be careful. It's not an exact number. Okay? 
Okay, while we're on this topic of, of trying to understand the world and trying to, to see more deeply into things you might not have been expected, yesterday we talked a little bit about related searches as a way of seeing what the collective Google brain is doing, what everybody's searching for. Google Trends is another tool that you can use to see what people are searching for. So, question for you, how many use Google Trends? Okay, okay, that's like a quarter of you, okay? So, what's nice about Google Trends, and I guess, sidebar comment, for all these things I'm telling you, do not write down the URL. You should never do that. When in doubt, search it out. Google Trends, guarantee it's the first result. Google Alerts, guarantee it's the first result. Google News, guarantee first result, all right? So for all these Google things, all you need is remember one or two words. Always search for it. Once you do that, though, you'll end up on a page that looks a little bit like that. And so your query would be like this. And what Google Trends does is it allows you to search the query volumes. And you can dice by country, by time, by kind, and so on. And you can get pretty far into understanding what people are searching for. This is handy for you as reporters because you may think of a particular story as following these search terms. But the world, in fact, says, oh, it's over here. These are the search terms we're using. For example, here I've done a comparison of two search terms in Google Trends. And the way you compare multiple terms, you, in the search box at the top, you put flu, comma, influenza, comma, whatever. The comma separates the terms. Okay. So in this case, we can see the red line is the, the search query volume worldwide for influenza. And you know that because if you look at the top there where it says worldwide in 2004 to present, that's giving you all the data facets for this particular search. So this is worldwide, 2004 to now, uh, all categories <laughs> web search. Okay. Now remember, it's not called influenza in France. So you have to remember that this is international searches, right? So you're not actually counting all of the worldwide in instances. You're actually just searching for these words. But nevertheless, nevertheless, look at the differences between the blue line, which is flu, and the red line, which is influenza. If you're writing an article and you only ever use the word influenza, some big fraction of your readers are never going to get it. They don't know that influenza and flu are the same thing. You can see the same kind of thing happening time and time again when people use very technical language, right? Are, it's, it's a temptation to use that, but in fact, you can see patterns like this. Um, also, uh, by the way, you can also see annual trends here. You can see seasonality effects. And back there in 2006 was a particularly bad flu year, and then 2010 was a horrible flu year. You can see, you, you probably remember we, had, we invented this thing, uh, Google, Google Flu Trends which is basically a model of this. Um, another thing to know about trends here is that if you click on any of these letters, that will give you significant news events that are coordinated with that, with that peak in the, in the graph. So you can actually start to see where these things are coming from. So here's a, 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 the kind of thing you could do. I've done, in this case, uh, four different search terms for tennis, football, basketball, and baseball. And I know the word football is contested, but work with me for a second, okay? What, what's interesting here is I've done this worldwide. If you're interested, say, in Australia, you would just, you can dice, you can uh, select that uh, tab worldwide and then select whatever region you want, whatever country you want. But nevertheless, you can see the original chart here, the color path here, where the U.S. is actually less than Australia or New Zealand, nevertheless. What's happening here is you can see the relative search volume for each of those terms and that seasonal variation. So the red line here is football, which is a combination of football and what we would call soccer. But you can see these fascinating uh, trends here. And the yellow trend here is, is basketball, and the green trend is baseball. And even though in the United States we think of it as the national pastime, it's not. Football is the national pastime, as you can see by the number of queries. As I said, you can dice by different regions, and so you can actually go through and, uh, for example, search on different countries, and within different countries, you can actually go down to a particular region. So, for instance, uh, you can look at just 
India football here as uh, compared for India versus the United States. Okay? Now, this is a very fast blast through Google Trends. I could give you a whole hour just on how to use trends for data analysis. But nevertheless, it, you, I encourage you to go explore it. Remember, these are not search volumes. They're not search volumes. They're percents. They're ratios. Okay? The other thing to know is that if you go into an increasingly small region so that the number of queries becomes below a magic threshold, we, get, we will stop giving you information. So you can't go all the way down to the city level. You can't go to the metro level. That's for anonymization purposes. Because if the number of searches goes below some fraction, it's really easy to reverse engineer and figure out, oh, it was you that did that query. And so we block that. Nevertheless, as an American, I found this particularly interesting um, that India had these uh, uh, peaks every few years, right? I mean, what's going on with that? Or um, I, this because I just did this one. Uh, just before I walked in here, uh, I guess I have to move this over. Oh, oh, oh there we go. So he, this is uh, Trends Live, but if I do something like FIFA, I keep hearing stories about FIFA. As an American, I have no idea what FIFA really is. <laughs> but I understand there's a, there's a guy and there's some money and... Um, <laughs> But I just want to show you th this uh, particularly interesting thing here. Um, uh, also, as an American, I have no idea why there's this giant peak every four years. <laughs> right? Uh, what's going on with that? Um, but nevertheless, we can, for example, click here, and I'm going to scroll down just to Norway, which is inconveniently in the middle of the alphabet. I can click here. I could actually go all the way down to different, uh, different regions, but I'm just going to do all of Norway. And now we're just seeing the trends search for, uh, for FIFA within Norway. And now, of course, I can keep adding new terms and I can do in different categories and so on. But I wanted to give you the sense that this is very easy to do. And if you want to see the news headlines, there are the news headlines. Uh, yeah, who's that guy? You know. Yeah, right, you get the idea. So trends is this really valuable thing. And what's even better in some ways, although incredibly nerdly, so this is only for the data journalists here, is the opposite of Google Trends, which is Google Correlate. That is, what you can do is you can search for queries that are correlated with other queries during that time period. For instance, here, what I've got is a search uh, for skiing. Okay, So what you're seeing here is, unsurprisingly, a very annual cycle every winter, right? Of course, if you look at, for example, southern hemisphere countries versus northern hemisphere countries, they are the opposite of each other's. Now, the question for correlate is, what kinds of behaviors are correlated with that? Can you find other query sets? So what you can do, uh, here I've actually done something, something fun and actually shifted the query skiing by 25 weeks, half a year. And I'm looking for query patterns that are similar to skiing, except in the summertime. Okay, So you see what I'm doing? I'm doing sporting queries for summer versus winter. And you can see what's so interesting about this is that uh, I've done the US here. I've done only US. Oddly enough, Colorado camping is highly correlated with skiing, except shifted summer to winter. Okay, So if you're a data journalist, this is an immense valuable resource to you, because all of a sudden you can start to see What's correlated? Is, uh, for example, kayaking correlated with summer camping? Yes, it is, 0.9, right? You can start to explore the query space. What other ways are people asking these kinds of information? Okay, so now, when I give this lecture in the United States, people are stunned by this part, okay? Now, I know you're going to say, oh, yeah, I knew that. Um, but they're stunned. Uh, so let me tell you, look, Google.com is the U.S. version, Okay. So remember, the thing, one of the things I said yesterday was that if there's a feature that I show you or you see it on the, in the news somewhere and it doesn't work in, say, Norway or India or whatever, google.com slash ncr will get you into the generic Google US and you can, all the features will work there. So, but for the, the, for the rest of the world, right, there's, of course, Mexico, Google, and there's uh, India, Google, and Saudi Arabia, Google, and 
we don't have quite Google for every country. There are a few countries we don't have it for, but we've got these nice um, uh, multi-language things like South Africa or, or Belgium or whatever. <laughs> now, one of the obvious things uh, you could do is uh, try to guess what the Google name is. It's not worth your time. Google space Bhutan or whatever the country is, right? Um, it's particularly interesting in that other country, that other Google you're using, to use advanced search within that country. I don't have to convince you why this, is, why this is necessary, why it's a good thing to do. But of course, news stories from Google India are very different than Google.com India news stories. You can also, of course, select different languages from those pages. So if I do a query like Eurozone, I can select which language I want that to be presented in. The problem we first ran into, another true story, we initially put it so that uh, all the languages would appear on the bottom in the local language. Of course, trying, in my case, to find the word English as written in Hindi is a losing idea. And when I went to Chinese, I was totally screwed. <laughs> right? So we obviously now offer each of the language options in the language of, uh, that it's written in. And of course, you can, pay it, you can do queries in those languages. However, one thing to know is that the landscape of information is not uniform and flat. For example, the web corpus of documents in Arabic is relatively small compared with, say, German, or compared with, say, French or something. It's a tiny, tiny sub subset of all the content that's out there. So even if you go to Google Saudi Arabia and you search in Arabic, it's the database at the bottom is just not that big. Right? So it's obvious how to do these things. Um, but one of the things to remember is that the, the extension is, is sometimes google.co.whatever, but in, for example, Rwanda, it's just .rw. Right? And in some places, you can't, there is no Google. Like, there is no Google Mayotte and no Google Bhutan. However, you can use the search within region feature in the advanced search page, and I'll show you that in a second. So search in those countries. Okay? Or you can use the site operator, which we'll also talk about, to search, for example, site colon YT to search in, in Mayotte or Bhutan. Now, I guess uh, the obvious question is, um, do, do you know all the top-level domains for all countries? No, you do not. Right? <laughs> okay. So how do you find it? Uh, Google top-level domains. Yeah. Uh, and you'll get the list. Uh, there are a bunch of lists out there. But as an interesting example, everybody knows South Africa, right? ZA. And this actually gets a lot of people in the United States. What's the country code for Spain? It's not SP. It's ES, right? España, right? Okay. What's the country code for Antarctica? Antarctica. There is a country code for Antarctica. It's AQ. But that's the kind of thing you can look up. Yeah, there are servers .aq that have a lot of information about penguins. I, I can't make this stuff up. Um, right? Of course, in the news, and the res but what's interesting is not only the news difference, but also the results will differ. You're looking for a Eurozone in India, google.in, will give you different results than from .es or from .no. Okay, one thing to realize is that there's basically the country is is the center of a, of attraction for the content in that space. So if you're trying to do a multinational reporting about some particular issue, say Eurozone, you might want to go look in .gr and .ie and .es and .pt and so on because you'll get different results. It, the world is not one giant uniform wormhole of content. Okay, now you've got that. So let me tell you a couple other things you need to know. First off, capitalization doesn't matter, with one exception. <laughs> you knew there was an exception. The word OR, when you want to do synonyms like X or Y, you've got to capitalize the OR. Otherwise, you're searching for the word OR. Right? That's the only exception. Capitalization doesn't matter. Uh, on the other hand, diacritical characters do matter. I've enjoyed seeing all the different Scandinavian names. And of course, here are three different spellings of this person's name, Martin, Morton, or however you pronounce it, right? Um, as you see, if you substitute that second vowel with the ring A or the slash O or whatever, you get very different results. However, if you leave out the diacritical marks, 
we will do the best we can. So, for example, uh, San Jose is spelled with an accent over the E. But trust me, Google says nobody in the U.S. knows how to type accents, right? So we'll synonymize all the misspellings of Jose with and without the accent, okay? If you really, if you really want it, you have to double quote it. Now, in opposition to that, special characters mostly don't count. As a programmer, this drives me crazy because I'd love to be able to search for uh, programmatic expressions using greater than signs and less than signs. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So, for example, if you search for Google square bracket X projects, that's the notation we use, square bracket around the X, it drops the square brackets, just completely ignores it. So with or without the square brackets makes no difference. Same is true for curly braces. Same is true for equal signs. Same is true for a lot of stuff. You cannot search for special characters in Google. Okay? That's problematic if you're trying to search for, for example, legal information or scholarly information, and you want that special paragraph mark or special section mark. You just can't do it. <laughs> now, um, I suppose most of you know about Google Translate, right? And uh, yes, you can tell me your horror stories later. Uh, but let me tell you a couple heuristics about it. Um, romance to romance language translation is not bad. Once you get out, you're like going to finish. Sorry, <laughs> finish is too complicated. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's really handy. For example, uh, here you see we've added uh, Haitian Creole after the Haitian earthquake. <laughs> A bunch of guys at, at work got together and basically brought up Haitian Creole as a language in about three days, which is a phenomenal piece of work, allowing people to do rescue and recovery operations and doing searches for that. So we can add languages on demand because, truthfully, not that many queries are made in Haitian Creole, right? But all of a sudden, when it was an uh, emergency situation, we can bring up a language quickly. So if, for example, you want to do a search, it's hopeless to do a search in Haiti for trash, the string, English string trash collecting, that's hopeless. But if you do it in Haitian Creole, you can get it translated to a decent search. Now, for me, I only speak two languages, so I feel embarrassed. But it's nice to know that I can do searches like this one, um, like this one here, where I heard a singer, a Japanese singer, and I thought, oh, this is great. I need to get her music. And so I typed in my best American approximation of her name, and it spell corrected her name. Now, think what it did. It took my wacky English and transliterated it into the Romanji, and then looked up the correct Japanese and gave me all of her content. That's a pretty phenomenal piece of translation skill. I could not have done that without Google Translate working in the background. So, one of the other things to remember here. Again, perhaps you already know this, but this, uh, this is really it was fascinating discovery for me, is that Wikipedia comes in other languages. Uh, surprise, surprise, right? And in fact, some of the corpora, some of the Wikipedia pages are really extensive in German and, and French and Italian and so on. Um, but the thing that I found that surprised me is that the Wikipedia articles are not the same language to language. They're really not the same. So here... For convenience sake, I've translated the, the Italian Wikipedia page into English. And I want to show you this quick animation doing a side-by-side -side scroll of the outline of the Wikipedia article in English on the right for Leonardo da Vinci. And I pull the Wikipedia article in Leonardo da Vinci in Italian on the left. Now watch this. Yeah, right. If you're going to look up a hero, look him up in the language that's most interested in him. The article in Italian is 23,000 words long. And in English, eh, it's Leonardo, 8,000 words. Or another way to think about it, the biography section of the Italian Wikipedia article is longer than the entire English Wikipedia article. Okay, just that one section. So if I want to learn about Leonardo da Vinci, I'm going to go read the Italian trans uh, Wikipedia article in translation or see where I'm going with this, right? Okay. This is particularly interesting. You take any hero, you know, take, uh, you know, uh, some, some famous Spanish conquistador, right? 
You want to read it in, in Spanish. You don't want to read it in English. Right? This is, becomes really interesting here when you, for example, look at different versions of the Wikipedia articles. This is the 9-11 um, article in English, Spanish, Arabic, and Persian. Okay? And one of the things I find so interesting about this is that these articles are very, very different. You look up something that seems non-contentious, like cat, right? You look at the, the Spanish article on cat in Wikipedia, it's radically different than the car- article in English. It's a cat. How could it be so different? I will leave that exercise for you, okay? Um, here's, for example, the Wikipedia article on English and in Russian on Russian mobs, okay? Uh, yeah, I should have known that one. I should have known that was going to be very different. But it's fascinating to see these differences. Okay, so let me switch to another topic here. Because one of the big things I want you to walk away with today is not the particulars of how to do search by image or how to do whatever, but is this sort of bigger point. And the bigger point is when you don't know how to do something or you're, something is bothering you, search for a tool that will help you do that thing, right? I'll give you some examples. I'm going to talk about a reverse dictionary, finding listservs, control F, and I'll give you one more, okay? So, for example, who knows what a reverse dictionary is? Anybody? Okay. This is great. I was at ALA, the American Library Association, giant conference. You would think they would know what a reverse dictionary was. Less than 10% of them raised their hand. Okay. A reverse dictionary is great. It basically allows you to search in the definitions for a word. So it's like a super thesaurus on steroids and drugs simultaneously. Okay? So you're writing a story about a, a recent air disaster, right? And what's that thing called in the front of the jet engine, the kind of curvy so- circular thing? So what you can do is um, you can ask your friends, but if you're at home or you're on assignment somewhere, what you might do is start your first search for a reverse dictionary. Now, there's a bunch of them out there. It's just a service that's provided by these different companies. And you can use, for example, OneLook as one of them. The key here is not that I'm selling OneLook. It's just a service. Is the idea of searching for a tool to do what you need. So in this case, you, do, uh, you go to OneLook and you type jet engine housing, whatever. And right there... Pod, nacelle, rotor, cowling. Those are all pretty good words. Okay. The idea, search for a tool. And if you don't know the tool exists, often the results will tell you about that. They will t- teach you what's out there. Okay. As an example, we all remember and hate listservs, right? Those email tools from, from the 60s, right? Maybe you are still signed up for a few of them. Think about this. If you're writing a story about, say, uh, a piece of software that's been purchased for way too many millions of dollars and is ha- universally hated by the employees, trust me, there's a list sure out there somewhere of employees complaining about that. You need to search for that. So one way to search for that is to find a list of listservs. And once you do that, all of a sudden, the world becomes your oyster. In the process of doing that, you'll discover what the employee names are, employee group names are, what that piece of software is also called. And you can often get into listservs, even closed ones, just by applying. There's some poor webmaster out there who says, yes, yes, yes. And it's usually 2 in the morning. And they're more than happy to say, yes, you can get in, even to closed groups. So that's a really convenient hack when you're trying to um, understand what's going on with, uh, with particular uh, topic areas like that. Now, I, since you're a journalist, I assume everybody knows control. Quick test. Control F? How many people use Control F? Command F? Okay. Edit find? Whatever. Okay, good. Now, here's the weird thing. You all know this, but 90% of the world that uses the Internet has no idea what we're talking about. Trust me. I have a long story about this. I will not tell you now. You can buy me a copy later. Um, but it's a completely supportable fact. I've tested literally hundreds of thousands of people on this in the U.S. and, and internationally. And nobody knows it. You're, you're professional writers. I've even run into people who have written books that you have read who do not know this. Nevertheless, uh, what happens, of course, is if you're on a long document, 
particularly long document, web document, like the California Vehicle Code, 65 pages long. You know how to get there almost instantly by doing Control F or Command F, right? For people who don't know this, and, it, and my statistics suggest there's at least one of you who does not know this, whoever it is, <laughs> learn this. Control F or Command F, it will help you out a lot. On Chrome, remember that in the, brow in the scroll bar on the right-hand side, it will give you the little yellow dashes indicating every hit in the document. This is particularly handy when you're looking for author names or company names because you can look at the document, say a very long you know, uh, corporate filing or something, and you'll see that this person is mentioned once at the beginning and once at the end and nowhere else. You are done, <laughs> right? You've, you've discovered something interesting about this. Now, to combine these two ideas of finding tools along with understanding what's possible, let me ask uh, this rhetorical question. How long would it take you to take the English King James Bible and find how often the word behold appears in it? Control F, Control F, Control F, Control F, Control F, right? It's a losing battle, okay? But one thing that's worth knowing, and I'm just going to show you this little video, and I'll sort of narrate it while, I'm, <coughs> while, I'm, while it's going. Um, this is me... Answer, I, I did a screen grab, screen capture, of me solving this problem. It's 35 seconds long. When someone asked me this question, how many times the word behold appear in the King James Bible, I knew something that you might not know about. Here I'm actually downloading the whole King James Bible from Project Gutenberg, which has open source text for all these things. And I do control F, behold. Now watch, see that scroll bar happening? Wham, like that. Look in the top right. Oh, can't see that. Uh, anyway, in the top right, uh, anyway, it actually had the answer in the top right. 1,506 instances of the word behold. Did you know that it gives you the hit, no, total hits up there? Sometimes that's really valuable. So in general, if you're going to be an expert, you need to know what these tools are. And everybody knows Control F. But in Chrome, it gives you this extra word count, which is really handy. Now, again, for the data journalists out there, um, first off, how many people know what a regular expression is? Anybody? Okay. You're the nerds, all of you. Okay. You're my friends, my people. Okay. Uh, for the rest of you, a regular expression is basically a pattern. You can say, here's a pattern. Hey, go find it for me. Okay. So it turns out Chrome has a regular, a regular <laughs> expression extension. So you know Chrome has all these extensions you can download, which changes the way the browser works. So why do you care? Because you can do things like this. Um, you can go to a web page and see here I've done Control F or Command F, and it pops up my search box there in the upper right. And I've typed Google, vertical line, Facebook, vertical line, Apple. What that means is find me all hits for either Google or Facebook or Apple on the page. So if I'm on this web page, guess what? It's just highlighted all of those words. How often have you found yourself doing multiple searches over the same page, which seems ridiculous? But there's more, right? Because you can do something like this, which says, find me all four-letter numbers, four-character numbers that begin with two. So what I'm looking for implicitly are all dates on the page. And when you do that search, you can find all those pages. So this is really nice because if you know this one trick this one weird trick, right? All of a sudden, you can do these immensely powerful searches. Now, if you don't already speak regular expression, you don't necessarily have to go out and, and learn it. But if you find yourself in this problem of trying to match, say, multiple versions of a single Arabic name, you can give this version of Gaddafi, this version of Gaddafi, this version of Gaddafi, and you look for all of them simultaneously. Now, as wonderful as Control-F is, doesn't solve all problems. So if you're like me, you've probably done Control-F on web pages before and said, I know it's here. Why doesn't it work? Well, there are a couple reasons. It's primarily when the entire document you think you're looking at isn't on the, actually in the buffer. It's actually not loaded. For example, if you're looking at YouTube uh, comments or YouTube hits, you may not find everything because... In this case, even though I know the Book of Mormon is a parody, it doesn't show up when I do Control-F. 
Well, the reason is all 177,000 results don't actually fit on one page. Okay, so it's a paginated set of results, like Google is. And so you can go to page two and do the search, you're, you're good, right? Some web pages have what's called infinite scroll. So like Facebook, or in this case, uh, the, the Chrome Web Store, it's only showing you what's currently loaded. And so as you scroll down and down and down and down, stuff from the top gets thrown away. Okay, so this is kind of a weird gotcha, because some of these, particularly social media, you cannot do a control F over the whole stream because it's by definition changing all the time. So it only keeps in memory what's currently visible, plus a little bit on the either end. Okay? So that will, you know, and there's no good solution for that uh, aside from doing a kind of entire uh, text capture as the thing is scrolling by. So, in particular, for things like, like uh, product stores. Uh, or Amazon, or whatever. Uh, I'll save questions yeah. to the end. What about PDFs? PDFs? PDFs, yeah. yeah. Um, if, uh, it should all load. If it's a really giant, you know, 10,000 page PDF, it depends on what your browser strategy is. No, I don't know what it is. Um, in general, though, it should all be there. Yeah. Yes. You're kidding. I'm sorry? Yeah, no. yeah, so for the video, the question was, does Control-F work everywhere in a PDF document? And the answer is, um, it should. It should, but it may vary. If you're viewing a PDF in a browser and it's a long document, it may buffer the document. It depends on the browser and depends on the strategy. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do here is go to slide. So let me see here. We're on slide what? Like... So I'm going to skip down here uh, to, to this one for fun. Um, so what I'm going to show you now for the next 10 minutes is basically different kinds of Google uh, content you may not know about that will open up new possibilities for, for investigation. So has, how many people use Google Patents? Okay. For the rest of you, the cool new hotness is that we've started loading European patents in. Okay. So you can go to Google US and do a patent search uh, and generally you want to use the advanced search feature. So let me just do this real quick. Um, okay, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do my search here. Google patents. Okay, so it's the very first hit. So that's the example of search it out. So I click here and you go to the ta -da, Google patents search. Now as I said, you generally will want to use the advanced search panel here. Um, so you can, for example, search different fields by assignee or company name or whatever. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to do uh, patents I've got. So I've double quoted my name because there are a gazillion Daniel Russells. Okay, and here are a whole pile of different patents uh, of which I've, I've done. Um, uh, here's one. I'll just click on one randomly here. So you can start to see what, what a uh, patent looks like. This is a U.S. patent, but as I said, European patents are in there as well. And you can start to actually look at the images, uh, when it was assigned, all this jazz. Um, I actually can't look at that for legal reasons, but <laughs> nevertheless. Um, the, US, the, the Google patent uh, search box is incredibly handy for looking at that kind of thing. It's particularly handy for monitoring tech companies because they will often apply for patents in advance of development of a technology. Okay, so if you want to see if, you know, XYZ company is going into nanotech, set up a Google alert, check on patents from XYZ, right? And you'll start to see anything that comes out that's new. Another resource you might not know about is um, Google data table search. Okay, now what this is, again, search for a Google data table. And what you'll find is there's a whole Google <coughs> offering here which does nothing but search for data tables. If you're a data wonk, this is really handy. So here what my query was is Connecticut. And the very first hit is, Conne is Connecticut Brownfields. So what you can do is, I did something similar for Norway. If you click on the first link there, it actually shows in place the top values of that, of that data table. 
And of course, once you've got a data table, you can import that. Or you see it says there, export to Google Sheets or export to Fusion Tables. Your data table is in your special repository. Okay, so now you can import this, export this from that source instantly into, say, Fusion Tables. And so this was creating this map of the brownfields, these polluted sites in Connecticut, was about a one-minute operation for me. And this is now an interactive map that I've got. Okay? So this is a really interesting game changer because all of a sudden you can find these tables and it will find a lot of different kinds of tables. And I won't guarantee we'll always convert them, but you can always export them and then run, say, Open Refine or something on that. Okay? Here, for example, is me just, uh, I'll quickly go through this. This is me importing all the Superfund sites, the giant, uh, the worst pollution sites in, in California. And that's literally a few seconds long. You can search for medicines this way and discover um, uh, testing results that are found that maybe people don't want you to find. In the same vein, what we're looking at talking about data, there's data table search, but there's also another resource at Google called Public Data Explorer. This is our collection of data that we've imported from, w with their cooperation, right, from the UN, from UNESCO, of different states, and so on. And what you can do is do a query like this one, uh, unemployment rate Maryland. And what it will do is it goes into the data sets, and you can get all the metadata associated with this, and actually pull up the data and create your charts very, very quickly. So what's nice about these data tables in Public Data Explorer is it gives you the ability to slice and dice depending on different uh, metadata fields. However, big careful gotcha here is um, you might be done here when you've got your data here. But if you're trying to do something more analytical the way we would as an investigative reporter, um, here, for example, I'm trying to compute how many students were produced to have PhDs in the U.S. every year. And it took me a long time to figure out that the metadata was telling me exactly the right thing to do, and I was not paying close enough attention. So in the session before, uh, Mark and Megan were talking about the importance of this. They're right. It's really easy to misread the metadata on a data table. So ultimately, I figured this one out, but it's, it's, it's always one of these things you have to constantly check. Okay. Uh, my last tool, then I'll jump right to the end, because this is so much fun. I'm, I'm, again, I want to reiter reiterate this point. It's important to search for tools. Don't think of Google as just being able to find the data or find the article or find the web page. So Google Earth, for example, is one of these great resources where you can find different kinds of tools. So for example, suppose you're on this beach on Hawaii and you want to know what time the sun rises. Well, <clears throat> remember this problem? Now you have to find the angle theta because it's a big mountain there and you've got to figure out when the sun clears the top of the mountain. How do you do that? Well, you go to Google Earth and draw a line and say, give me the elevation profile for that point, that line. <laughs> and you know that because you did the tool search, right? You said, Google, what application gives me elevation profiles? And it says, hey, Google Earth, okay? So I did not know that before I started this task. So now I'm a smart guy, and I got the elevation profile. There it is. I download the data, and now... I went to school, and I know how to calculate theta and compute the tangent, and the math people, the non-math people are going, ah! <laughs> and I had to compute the arctangent and blah, 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 and I discovered it's actually, ra it, ri it rises 34 minutes over, after, right? So on, right? And there it is. I went out and took the picture. Excellent. <laughs> Yay for me. <laughs> but, but, I was a dumb guy because I forgot the basic concept here of looking for a tool. I went ahead and did all the trigonometry one step at a time. What I should have done was search for right side triangle side calculator, right? And once you do that, there are a million of them out there. You don't have to look up arctangent anymore. You just t drop it in, and there's the number, right? And you convert it, and blah. And the thing that actually really killed me is that later I discovered there's actually the Sunrise Calculator tool in Google Earth. <laughs> I was smart enough to find the elevation profile, but not smart enough to find the tool that would, right? So there's a lot of capability here, uh, including the ability to do archival imagery. 
So this is Las Vegas, Nevada as of 1948. This is more recent. Um, you can do a lot of stuff with Google Earth. Okay, let me, let me sum up here and, and go to the end here. Um, this is all available on that slide deck, and I'll put up the, the URL at the very end again. See all the stuff you're missing? Can I do one more? It's a one-minute story because it's so interesting. Let me test. How many people know what EXIF data is? EXIF data? Metadata? Okay, uh, this is so good. It will scare the bejesus out of you. Um, but I've got to find it, though. Here it is. Um, So um, somebody sent me this picture and said, okay, smart guy at Google, where was this picture taken? How would you figure this out? And trust me, dropping this in a Google image search doesn't work because it was just a, some guy on a cell phone at the beach. Right. Well, I thought, I know how to do this. Cell phones, as it turns out, when you take pictures, attach a blob of metadata called EXIF, E-X-I-F, like that which has exposure settings and focal length and mm, all that jazz. It also has the lat long. Did you know you were emitting lat long every time you uploaded a cell phone photo? Yeah, you are. Once you do that, you copy out the lat long, drop it into Google Maps, and it shows you exactly where it is, right there. And of course, you can go immediately into Street View and get exactly the same photograph. Okay? So that took me, oh, 25 seconds to do. Interesting when you get cell phone uh, images from sources that are arguing it's, you know, this is Syria, and you look it up and it's really, you know, New Hampshire. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you that because that's such a fun story. Okay, now I'll, now I'll quit. Um, I'll quit with just uh, one, one short video here, which is about sort of where Google is going. So this is a, a, a 30-second video just to give you a sense for what kinds of stuff we can do now. This is not, this is not an announcement. This is stuff that you can run on your Google right now. Who painted the Sistine Chapel? Sistine Chapel ceiling was created by Michelangelo. What is x squared plus y cubed? What is the, the electron configuration of lithium? The electron configuration of lithium is He2S1. Show me a picture of Guernica by Picasso. Here you go. Some pictures related to Guernica. What was the name of the dog on the Lewis and Clark expedition? Oh, okay, uh, we didn't get that one. <laughs> But, but I put it in there because he, that's in the near term to be able to answer a question like that. And so it changes a lot of the game for us as reporters, as people who assemble information, to the skill of asking the right question. In some sense, that's always been our thing, and we've been hobbled by Access or SQL or Google or whatever, right? We have to learn all this sort of arbitrary stuff. The world is changing. So I want to leave you with a couple of quick thoughts. When in doubt, search it out. In particular, search for tools. Remember that there's a whole pile of stuff that Google has you probably don't know about yet. If you search for the thing, you'll find it, like patents or, or whatever, right? And it's one of these things where practice really makes a difference. So um, I just mentioned this in my last class, but I've got an online class which is now open called powersearchingwithgoogle.com. You can join in. We'll be, if you don't make it into this class, we'll be opening another one in about two weeks, okay? So you can always get it. Here's a handy cheat sheet, which prints out to a handy mouse tablet size form. So if you want to get that. Again, this is in the, the slide deck. Um, I have a handy game, if you want to play it, called like googleaday.com, uh, which tests your ability to answer these Google questions. Um, I will leave you with uh, one other thought here. Uh, if you have an interesting story or an interesting Google challenge, write to me. I'm really interested in connecting with you guys. Uh, I can't, if all of you add, write to me today, it'll be a little too much. But, you know, remember, that's my email address, okay? I also write a blog, and every week I put up another challenge that requires your fairly deep research skills. And even if you can't spend the time to, to do the problem itself, there's an active conversation that always goes on for every week. And so this one basically is, yeah, see that sign? 
what the heck is it? And why should you not go there right now? You can discover all that by using, I'll tell you, I'll give you the big hint, use the EXIF data off that picture on the web, and you can start to discover everything there. Okay? There's all my data. I'll stick around for questions. Thank you very much for coming here. Okay, we got time for questions. Anybody wants to stick around? Questions? If you have a question, come and take, I'll bring the mic to you so that your yeah. question can be on the audio. Yeah, sure. Question? Yeah, right here. Ah. I've been waiting for yeah, I've been ignoring you, sorry. Oh, waiting for me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, just to check out if I understood properly. Yeah. When you have um, the, you know, the counter, the number of results, it refers to documents, right? Yes, web pages. Web page. Yeah. And uh, when you go on Google Trends, are, uh, are queries, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, right. Don't so that's a, good, that's a really good point. Uh, Google Trends only measures the queries made in whatever region you're, you're mm. testing. Okay. The volume of queries, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Other questions? I know. I'm standing between you and drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>